Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. I know it's the last session of the conference, so I appreciate you guys coming here. My name is Tara Raj. I'm a program manager at Microsoft working on the C++ team. And here I'm talk here to talk to you about C++ development with Visual Studio Code. Oh, uh, no. Are you able to hear now? How about now? Okay, yeah. yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so this is actually my first C++ now. So I'm super excited to have the chance to attend and speak. A little bit of background as to what we're going to talk about today. It's going to be a very demo heavy presentation. And the goal is not necessarily to show you complicated code. I know you've already seen a lot of that this week. So instead, I'm here to show you more about the tools that we can help you with to write your code more productively and write it more efficiently. As far as a quick agenda today, I'll give you a little bit of an overview about Visual Studio Code, then walk you through some of the recent improvements that we've made to give you a simpler experience in VS Code with C++. Then I'll take you through some tips and tricks, some shortcuts that maybe you didn't know about already, how we've improved our IntelliSense performance, and then get into some really new goodness that we have, which is Visual Studio Code Remote Development, which was actually just released last week. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about cross-platform development, which is why I have these two machines here with me. And the goal of today for you guys, I want you to be able to walk away with at least one new thing that you learned and hopefully one new thing that you want to try once you leave this room. If you aren't familiar with Visual Studio Code, it's free, it's open source, it's also cross-platform, so it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. In this past year's Stack Overflow survey, it was actually the top most used text editor. And we have a C and C++ extension available for you in Visual Studio Code so that you can take advantage of IntelliSense, debugging, and things of the like. The extension itself, the existing functionality we have is that you can edit your co code, you can build it, you can run it, uh, you can use the command palette to execute various commands to help you with your development, and there is IntelliSense completion. Some of the new stuff we have is dot comments. We have improved member function completion, so I put that under the umbrella of IntelliSense. We have build and debug active file, which I'll demo in a minute, as well as a configuration settings editor UI. And that was by popular demand from a lot of our first time users and students using Visual Studio Code. And the final thing we have is improvements just to the editor and configuration experience in general, where we've included a lot more IntelliSense. So without further ado, I promised a demo heavy talk, so let's get into some demos. The first demo that I'm going to show you is a simpler experience for code editing. So I'm actually going to start a simple project from scratch to show you how quickly you can get editing with VS Code with the extension. So the first thing I'm going to do is create an objects folder. And I'll put a header file in here. So today I'll show you a really simple program where we're going to have a box object, we're going to give it a length, height, width, and we'll calculate the volume. Simple console application. So the first thing I want to do is include IO stream, since I think we'll need that. Oh, actually, I will do my header file first. So if def, let's call this box h, let's define that. And as I'm going through, I'm just tabbing to complete what I have. So it's as simple as that to kind of get set up. So let me create a struct. Let's call it, whoops, call that box. So it automatically populated that for me based on the fact that the header name of this file is box. So let's create a couple 
variables. So let's do a length width and height. And let's also create a function. So let's call this volume. And volume will take in a length, a width, and a height. And so with that, I have some simple IntelliSense. Just want to make sure I added everything that I wanted to, but at the same time, let's put in some comments just in case I forget what I had. So let's say box object, it takes in a length, a width, and a height. And I promise these comments will come in handy later. I'm not just doing this for fun. And it will output a volume. So I just have a text file just to make sure I have everything I wanted to in there. Yep, I also need to return something in this function itself. So let's return length. It looks like I actually spelt that wrong. And it's starting to populate my IntelliSense here. So it knows that I'm looking at these various parameters. So even when I just type H, I'm getting that height as a suggestion. So now let's create another file, which will be our, oops, I don't actually want that under my objects. So let me click up here and create a new file called box sample dot cpp. And so in this, now I'm going to include IO stream, and it's starting to populate what I have. One thing that's new is the include autocomplete. So now if I want to include that header file, it'll start to populate what I have. So now that I have objects, it knows that box H is in it. So now I won't make you sit through all of my coding. But a couple things that I want to show you here is when I have that box object, remember how I had those comments at the top. So something new that we just added in our March release is when I hover over this, I can see the comments from the header file. And I can also then right click and say, go to definition. And that, whoops. So when I'm on my box object, if I go to definition of that, it will take me to where that's defined in my header file. So you can imagine if I had a much more complicated project, I would be able to navigate through a lot easier now. Couple other things that I wanted to point out, if, let me take this part out real quick, that we have included member function completion. So when I have that package, if I say volume, it starts to tell me what volume actually has in it. And that would more easily help me complete this function. So I'll take in package dot length. Same thing again, package dot width and package dot height. So all of that pretty simple to get started. One other thing I want to point out is that we actually have multi-cursor support now. And with that, if you say Alt and click, I can actually have multiple cursors. And if I didn't want to call this height, and I wanted to call it top, 
I can pretty easily change that. But let's put it back to height. And so now I'm happy to tell you guys that starting in our May release, we actually created a really simple way for you to get started with your first program. And that's through build and debug an active file. So really all I need to do is just right click in our context menu and say build and debug active file. Under the hood, what this is doing is it's creating a task JSON file for you as well as a launch JSON file. And that'll go through your system and see what compiler you have, what build system is on your machine, and actually create those files for you. And so we take our best guess at what you have, we create the tasks in the launch file, and then we start your debugging session. So here I am using my MS build system. I have CLEXE, which is the developer command prompt. And so I'll be using that to build and debug. So here, I'll start to go and put in, go ahead. Which version of compilers do you and support? So the various compilers that we have, we have um, MSVC, Clang, G++, any of your basic compilers. You can actually configure a custom compiler if you wanted to. So there's a C -CP pro CPP properties JSON file that I can actually pull that up to show you what it looks like. I was planning on doing that anyway, so now sounds like a good time to do that. So there are two ways that you can edit your configurations. There's a JSON file, and now in our May release, there's actually a UI. And that was due to a lot of students and first-time users having a really difficult time getting started with C++, and they didn't know things like a compiler path or include path and how to use that. So this is how you can essentially set up a custom compiler. So really, you just need your compiler path and the version of IntelliSense that you want to use. A lot of students, for example, didn't know what the possible IntelliSense uh, modes are. So that's why we added this well, UI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, we wanted to make your C++ configuration as easy as possible. So we now have this UI where I can go through and say, hey, here's my compiler path, IntelliSense mode. And we actually have that dropdown of the three most common IntelliSense modes. So if I were to change this to G GCC right now, it's telling me, hey, that's incompatible with your compiler path. And so that's something that we really hope will help people get started with this quickly. So now I'll go back into the box sample. And I'm going to set myself a couple of breakpoints here. And it's just as easy as that to put in breakpoints. And now I'm going to build and debug this. So as I said, pretty simple. Add in a few parameters. And actually, when I hit my breakpoint, something that's really neat is that I can see the values of the variables. So two, three, and four. And actually, even if I go over the object itself, I can see what the values there are. So it's really helpful when you're in a debugging situation and you don't want to put in a bunch of printf statements, for example. So this is a way you can see what's actually there. So now I want to go ahead, step over the breakpoint. I see the volume is 24. So pretty simple way to get started with build and debug. One other thing I wanted to point out before I move off this file is let's say you want to include something like boost or catch2. We actually have a C++ package manager that we've been working on called VC package. And if you'd like to see that project, we have a GitHub repo where we have about a thousand different libraries included in this. And that's under the ports folder if you wanted to look in there. But essentially, what you can do with VC packages, if you use this integrate install command, you can then get that IntelliSense working in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. So if I say pound include boost.h, it'll say, hey, add this to your include path. So you'll go into that JSON file that I just showed you guys, add that to your include path, 
and you're ready to go. So pretty simple way to import libraries and get them into your projects. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So not yet. We're, it's something that we're working on to get that integration directly in. That integration actually does exist in Visual Studio, though, if that was something of interest to you. But it's pretty easy to set up. You just go to the command line. If you want to install a package, you just say VC package install. And whatever, whatever the package name might be, you can search for them. You can list your packages. So it's a pretty simple setup. So just to recap what we went over, go ahead. Do bug fixes to each other and get stuff break once and expect uh, yep. back labels? Uh, do those also work with GCC or Pi? They do, absolutely. And I'll show you an example of that on my Mac as well. Yeah. So just to recap of some of the new and simplified things that I just showed you, we have dot comments, improved member function completion, build and debug active file, that configuration settings UI, and then we have squiggles for malformed configurations. The squiggles, as you did not see, are in that UI as those red errors. So whichever you feel comfortable with, if you prefer a UI environment for configuration, or if you prefer JSON, it's up to you. Go forth, use whatever you might want through the command palette. So the next thing I want to show you are just some super quick tips and tricks. I mentioned one of them, which was the multi-cursor um, selection. So I'll go through right now and just show you a couple quick little neat things that maybe you hadn't seen before could make your life a little bit easier. So let's go back in. One of the things that Visual Studio Code offers is a command palette. So when you first open up your various files, you kind of just get that editor experience, and you don't have much else. So to open up the command palette, you use Control shift p and you can get to various commands. So if I want specific C and C++ commands, I start with the prefix C slash C++, and it shows me various commands. So that's, for example, how I could get to my configurations, JSON or UI. We even have um, tasks. So that's the task file that was generated for me when I went through build and debug active file. So command palette is super, super useful. You can also do things with your command palette related to your integrated terminal, for example. So if I want to, let's say, terminal set default shell, I can actually set what I want the default shell to be. So one of you just asked whether I can build and debug with things like GCC and Klein. So let's set the default shell to WSL bash. And I can open up that terminal. So new terminal, the shortcut for that is control, shift, and apostrophe. So when I open up a new terminal, I can actually select WSL. So setting my default shell, set it to WSL bash, and usually I should be able to see one of those. but why don't I flip over to Visual Studio Code Insiders and try it that way. I've been playing around with this quite a bit, so I might have broken something. But anyway, I'll show you guys a little bit more with WSL in a bit. But yeah, you can use a couple different shortcuts like that. Aside from the integrated terminal, so I showed you this context menu for build and debug active file. There are a couple different ways that you can get to the debugger as well. So you can also go to the start debugger shortcut. You can also use your classic F5. So those are a few of the debugger shortcuts. Um, some of you might be very interested in the themes of your programs. And so the way that you can change your theme very quickly is to say Control K, Control T. And so I can toggle between various themes. So if you're not a dark theme person, for example, you can change it to light theme. Or you can create a custom theme. 
but I know most of you here like the dark theme, so I will flip back. The last thing that I wanted to show you, aside from our multi-cursor support, is also editing side by side. So just to reiterate, if you want to do multi-cursor support, it's Alt-Click, and that allows you to put in multiple cursors at any given time. The side by side is Control slash, and whoops, that was for the comment. Um, yeah, and so basically you can go through a number of shortcuts in Visual Studio Code. Most of these menus will also put the shortcuts next to them. If you go to the Visual Studio Code documentation, there are hundreds of shortcuts. I just gave you about a dozen right now. To recap, there, these are the shortcuts that I just showed. Command palette, if you want to change your configuration, build and debug active file, some of the command line stuff. So this was essentially the high level overview of some of the Visual Studio Code things. Now I want to dig in a little bit deeper into some of the more advanced stuff. So the next demo that I'm going to show you is improved IntelliSense performance. So I'm going to switch over to my Mac here for this next part. And all of the things that I'll show you on the Mac right now for IntelliSense performance does also work on Windows and Linux. But I thought it could be fun to flip around between operating systems to show you how cross-platform and smooth Visual Studio code can be for you. So here I am going to open a folder. As many of you are here to learn new C++ things, I had someone earlier this week recommend to me a GitHub project under the algorithms called C++, where you can go through some of the basic data structures and various algorithms to refresh your memory if you're not up to date on them. So I got this C++ project. It's actually pretty large. And previously, we've had a lot of complaints about IntelliSense performance. So we actually went through and added some functionality that was released in May to improve IntelliSense performance. And one of the ways in which we do that is when you open a folder. The other is when you actually load a file in the editor. So here I have a linked list data structure opened up, pretty simple stuff. You'll notice here on the sidebar that I have a little green dot with the VS Code file. That actually tells me that something was changed in there. And so we have this IPCH. So what this is actually doing, and this functionality that was added, is auto PCH. So we're pre-compiling your headers for you. If you have a really large project or you have a lot of header files included, normally IntelliSense would take quite a while to populate. Now with automatically pre-compiling those headers, we can populate your IntelliSense much quicker. And that also works you know, when you scroll through. This project itself doesn't have errors, but it would allow you to go through that process and get that IntelliSense populated much faster. If you do want to change the settings for that, you can actually go to the general VS Code settings. And it's under IntelliSense caching. So here, you can change your cache path. If you don't want it in that .vs code folder, you can go ahead and change the location to which the pre-compiled header information is going. You can also change the cache size. So if you see this and you think the default is way too high for yourself, or you want a smaller potential, so the default here is the highest potential amount of space we would take up for the pre-compiled headers. If you feel that that's too high for your machine or your project, you can go ahead and just change that setting to something lower than that. The other thing, go ahead. So you're saying that's the per project, not global settings, so I can have multiple projects all consuming five gigs of pre-compiled IntelliSense? Yes. Yeah, so it's a per project or per workspace. And then the global setting itself is not available yet. Yeah. 
And there's a blog post that details a little bit more about how the IntelliSense caching itself works. And we're taking in feedback as it comes in since we just released this in May. And one of the things we're considering is allowing you like a per folder setting or generally decreasing that default number. I know it's an attempt to create all of the project and having all of the project having very large people power headers potentially working around that could lose a lot of disk space. Yeah. Pressure on a MacBook. Yes, yes, it could potentially be using a lot of disk space. So we are aware of that feedback. Just a question. Right, uh, so may our audience ask a question? Can you repeat the question? So that okay. Oh, the question repeated. Yes, sure. I will repeat future questions. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you while working on a large project is an extension called GitLens. So you might notice here, I can actually see who has worked on this project. And I can look and see, hey, like there were three different authors. This person edited it a few months ago. I can actually go through and see what the changes were. So something else that GitLens allows is to see the file history. So I can actually go through and look at the diffs. Three months ago, there was some changes made. So GitLens is an awesome way to integrate Git into Visual Studio Code. It really shows you how you can take something so simple like what I showed you, just a console application, and now we're getting a lot more complicated here. We're looking at precompiled headers, we have Git integration, we can see the diffs pretty simply. And this is how you can take VS Code, which is a pretty lightweight tool, and start to add more functionality to it depending on what you're doing. Go ahead. Um, Here's a dumb question. With the Git lens, can I have a live view of my disks against my current RAM? Yes, you can. So awesome. the question was whether you can, ha with Git lens, if you can have a live view of your editing versus the branch that you're working on. The answer is yes, it's pretty awesome actually. And there, GitLens also has a bunch of different settings that if you want to have custom settings or add in functionality, it's pretty easy to do so. Uh, does it have a built in Git blame? So the question was Does GitLens have a built in Git blame? I don't think it does, but I'm actually not sure. I haven't I tried it. I wasn't sure if it was added to that or not. Okay, I'm not sure if it was added to it. Yes, yeah, so to recap the demo that you just saw, Auto PCH, IntelliSense cache settings, and Git Lens. So three pretty awesome things that you can use if you're working on large projects. So now I'm going to get to the portion of the talk where I get to speak to you about what I find most exciting and new in Visual Studio Code, it's remote development. So remote development, was a functionality and extension that was released actually just last week. And what this allows you to do is you can essentially develop your code locally and connect to a remote environment. So let's say you are developing on a different operating system than you're deploying to. This can help you with that. If you want to sandbox your development environment, if you have run times that are not available on your local OS that you want to use. You can access an existing environment from multiple locations. So if you have a VM in production that your code is in, you can debug an application running somewhere else. So your code actually doesn't even need to be on your machine for you to get that local environment. So what I'm going to show you next is how we can use both Docker and the Windows subsystem for Linux with remote development. And both of those are going to be on my Mac here and my Windows machine targeting Linux. You might be curious how this actually works, so I want to walk you through a little bit of the architecture. We've essentially taken the local operating system and abstracted it from the remote OS. So what's on your local OS right now in VS Code is your themes, your UI, all of that side of things. And what's on the remote side, the VS Code server, are your extensions. We're connecting you to your source code through the server side. So to unpack this a little bit, what that means is when I have 
this remote development setup, I'm actually going to get the extensions that are related to the source code and the environment that I'm connecting to. So when I'm on my Mac here and I have a Linux Docker container, I'm actually going to use the C++ Linux version of the extension and get all of the Linux related debugging, the configurations, and generally the IntelliSense support for that. So without further ado, let's get into a couple demos with remote development. So the first of which I'm going to show you is right here on my Mac. One thing I'd like to mention as well is that this is currently only available in Visual Studio Code Insiders. So that's what this little green logo is. It means that I'm on Insiders. I have a simple Hello World application. What I've added to this is I've added some CMake files and generally used a CMake template to put CMake and GCC inside of my Docker container. I use the Docker extension to set up this container for the first time. I also have the Docker desktop version. So that was a way in which I was able to actually go configure a Docker container. I just linked my Docker account and was able to create an image that way. And so what I have here is the set of extensions that I have. And so if I search remote development, oh, I'm not connected to the internet. So let me just show you what I already have installed. So here in my dev container, I have C and C++ installed. Locally, I have Docker and I have this remote containers extension. And so when you install the remote development pack, you get remote containers, you get remote SSH, and if you're on Windows, you also get remote Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL. So here I'm using the remote containers extension. And how I know I'm using that is right here in the status bar. It says dev containers and that I'm using C++. You can also see this little blue icon here next to C, C++ that shows me I'm using this in a remote environment. So I'm actually using the Linux version of the extension now. And so I can open folders locally. I can rebuild a container. I can forward ports. I can do essentially what you would want to do with the container remotely as far as connecting to it and developing against it. So now that I'm in my Docker container, it actually pulls that up on the integrated terminal. And with that, I can take my simple Hello World application. And now I can debug it with Clang. And that's the Linux version. So with that, pretty simple. Execute that hello from a Linux container. So as you can imagine, as I said earlier in this presentation that I'm showing you some pretty simple programs, but if you take a much more complex system with C and C++, and here I have my make file, CMake already configured, let's say you have a much more complicated environment that you want to share with people at your company. This is going to be super, super helpful for you. You put in your Docker container, you can deploy the containers, you can connect them in a really simple fashion. Like this took me just 10 minutes to set up when I first set it up. Documentation is great on it, and I will be putting out a blog post on some specific tips and tricks on how you can do this with C and C++. So for example, generating the CMake file and how I got Ubuntu, I installed my compiler and everything there. I didn't want to take you through the entire installation process in this demo, but yeah, that's just the basic way in which you can use Docker. And here I used it on a Mac. I connected to Linux and I was able to compile my application pretty quickly. So now I'm going to switch back over to my Windows machine. 
And here I'll show you remote development now with the Windows subsystem for Linux. How many of you have heard of WSL before? OK, so a few of you. What I'll actually do then is explain a little bit about what WSL is. So WSL is the Windows subsystem for Linux. It's a way in which you can actually get a native Linux command line experience on your Windows machine. And the way in which this is made possible is that you essentially will enable the Windows subsystem for Linux on your machine, and then you install a Linux distribution from the Windows Store. So right now, I have Ubuntu installed. And it is your classic kind of command line environment. So I can do things like apt-get update. If I say lsla, you can see like I have root. I have various uh, different Linux files that you would expect to be there. There's bin bash. So that's essentially the very high level overview of WSL. If you have more questions about it, happy to answer those as well. But for the point of this demo, we'll be using WSL as a way in which we can get a Linux environment here on Windows, and we're specifically using that extension. So now when I go to look at my extensions, the enabled ones, you'll see I have remote WSL as one of them. And that comes out of our remote development pack, which gives you those three, WSL, SSH, and Docker. So now I want to take this project, you know, whatever I have here, and I want to connect to WSL to do some Linux development. So if I go down here in that little status bar again, I want remote WSL, I want a new window. And so here, I'm opening the remote, I'm connecting to the VS Code server. So the VS Code server that it's saying there is what I showed you in the architecture diagram where we had our local and we have the remote side. This is the server that is spinning up in this WSL instance for us. So now I have my WSL connected and I have that new window. I now want to open a project, but I actually don't want to open a project that is on my Windows file system. I'd like to open a project that is saved on the Linux side. So when you install WSL, you get the distro, but you also get a different file system. It's actually a Linux file system. And so I've saved a few projects in that Linux file system using Linux line endings using the extended Linux attributes for those folders, but I can still open them now locally. So I'm going to open a folder. I have a simple hello world application. I say OK. Those of you who've used WSL before might be aware of the fact that it's very difficult to find your Linux root file system. Rootfs, uh, you have to go through a pretty long string of for Ubuntu, it's canonical group, whatever. Um, initially, we deliberately made that pretty difficult to find because we did not support the Linux ac extended attribute fi for files themselves. That support now exists, so something like this is pretty easy to deal with if you want to go back and forth between editing in Windows and Linux. And when you edit those files, it'll still be preserved. So now I have my Hello World application. I have that bash terminal open. So as we spoke about before, various debuggers and compilers that you could have. I'm here on Windows, but I'm going to use GCC. Whoops. So here I will say GCC. Um, I have my hello.cpp. I think I needed to link that. Let's 
try that again. So if I say GDCC, and I wanted to link. I had a feeling at some point one of these live demos would break. But at any rate, take my word for it, you can compile that and actually get the output itself. And so that's essentially how you could use remote WSL development here on your Windows machine. So the question was whether you could use build and debug active file here. The answer is yes. So it would work similarly to how build and debug active file would if you had the native Linux environment running. It's the same extension. So with that, to recap what we've done with both Docker and WSL. So with Docker, we had the overview of how you can set that up using the Docker extension. Um, setting up Docker itself is the same as it would be on any other environment. You can get configured pretty quickly with the remote Docker extension, and you can run whatever you want to targeting any, any environment. So I showed you how to do it on a Mac targeting a Linux Docker container. With WSL, what we did was we set up the extension, we configured our compiler, and we were supposed to be able to run targeting Linux. And so that's essentially the overview of how remote development works. The last thing that I had to show you today is cross-platform development made easy. So once again, with WSL, um, you can really go through the C++ development experience on Windows and target Linux in a really lightweight fashion. I'm not connecting to a fully featured VM to do this, and I'm able to work locally in a pretty simple way. So since some of you are not as familiar with WSL, I'll show you a couple basic things of how you get started and then show you how you can then target Linux with this. So one of the things I can do is apt-get install update. Pretty simple. Um, I'm not connected to the internet, so I don't have that update. If I do something like screen fetch, what I want to point out here is it says my operating system is actually Ubuntu. And it says that it's running on this kernel that has Microsoft in it. So essentially what's happening here is I have the Linux user mode, and it's running on top of the Windows NT kernel. So we have an LX core sys binary that actually takes these system calls from Linux and translates them into something the NT kernel can understand. So that's why here it's telling us that our operating system is Ubuntu, but the kernel itself is Windows. So there are various things that we can do, but as far as C++ goes, I can open up my samples. So I had in here um, the main.cpp file. So let's say I want to open that up in Notepad. I can do so uh, exactly that way from the command line. And so here, something to note is that we actually now support Linux line ending. So I had been editing this on both the Windows and the Linux side. So normally in Notepad, that would have showed up as a bunch of jumbled nonsense. But now that Linux line endings are su supported in Notepad, you can actually open up a file like this. So if you want to do this in VS Code, you can do it similarly from the command line there. And all of this works directly in the integrated command line. So if 
For example, hey, I'm in a code editing environment, but I kind of want to use Vim sometimes. I can say vi hello.cpp and actually pull that up in the integrated terminal in VS Code. And so the point of showing you guys this is to really drive home the fact that with VS Code, you can use whatever environment is most comfortable to you. So if sometimes you want to use the terminal, other times you want to use the editor, it's up to you. You have the choice, the freedom, the ability to do so. And with that, that basically takes me to the end of all the demos I had for you. I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions at the end. So just to recap that last demo, we looked at using WSL. Um, oh, I actually missed the part about setting up multiple configurations. And then we did the integrated terminal. So as far as setting up multiple configurations, let me go back into this. If we go into our JSON file, right now I have just one configuration. I can actually go through and set up a WSL configuration if I wanted to, for example. So I could go through here. I could say, hey, I want WSL. And I would then need to change my compiler path. So my compiler path, which I had here, is under user and G++. So I can go through here, get rid of what I had pasted for my Windows compiler path, and I can put in WSL. And then, of course, I don't want to use the MSVC version, so I want to use GCC. And so that's a way in which you can have multiple configurations if you wanted to with the CNC++ extension. If you want to toggle between those configurations, you can go to the status bar, and that'll allow you to toggle your configurations, for example. So there's a lot that you can do here, and you can really get deep into having multiple configurations, targeting multiple environments with VS Code. Now, is it also possible to set up multiple configurations using the configuration UI? So the question was whether it's possible to create multiple, multiple configurations using the config UI. So right now, that's not actually something that's possible. It's coming soon. But what you can do currently from the UI itself is you can change the active configuration that you're working in. We hope that soon we can have a control where essentially you would add a config or swap between them. But this is you know, the current changing them for now. Yeah, good question. Yep, so that essentially takes me to the end of all the demos. I'll leave this up here in case you guys have any resources that you'd like to check out. As I mentioned, we'll have a few blog posts coming out on remote development soon. Um, question? Yeah. Um, how does this integrate with uh, Visual Studio? Is there any way can I, that I can open existing VC projects from Visual Studio in Visual Studio Code? So you can open up your, like, the question was whether you could open up Visual Studio projects in Visual Studio Code. The short answer is yes. You can open up essentially any project files, any folders that you might have. And specifically, C++ will work between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. You can also open up your like VS Proj files. Um, something that we recently added to Visual Studio is remote development support. So if you wanted to do what I showed you here with WSL on VS Code, you can do the same in Visual Studio now. And that was in 2019 Preview 1 Update 3 that just got released. So you can really like go through this cross-platform development scenario quite simply now. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, one, does this support USB debugging? So the first question was whether this supports USB debugging. Uh, the answer is yes. You will need to configure it, however. And so you can do that with not just C++, but other languages as well. It's generally a configuration that you will need to set up in your launch JSON file. 
And so any of the debugging things that you'd want to do, you do through this launch JSON file. This is a global uh, VS Code setting. And when you go to add configurations, there are a ton of configurations that you can choose from. You can add your own. So USB, for example, could be something that you want to debug against. Yeah. And the yeah. other one is network kernel debugging. So is that possible? what specifically did you want to do? But the question was about network kernel debugging. Just actually being able to connect to, for example, Visual Studio or WinDBG. You can connect to an IP and everything, and it works just fine. But I'm not sure if you can do it in code at all. Yeah, so I think you could do that through an SSH um, tunnel if you set that up, potentially. I haven't tried the scenario myself of to do, to do the network kernel debugging. Um, I'm pretty sure you can get that set up, though, if you have the proper like SSH or IP side of things to send that through. Um, I don't see why not. Yeah. Independent question. Long, as a long-time Borland customer, one of the f neat things that IDE had was if I wanted to do a quick scratch project to test something, mm -hmm. I could create a new project that I didn't have to give it everything, never had to save it to disk. It would just compile and run in memory and I'd throw it away. So do you have anything that's similar to lightweight just for a really quick scratch, quick little experiment, throw it away? What's the lightest way yeah. pro workflow that we can do? Really good question. So the question was about whether there is a lightweight way that you can create a project and throw it away quickly. And I really recommend the VS Code remote debugging or remote development extension for that. Uh, specifically, something like a Docker container would work very well. So as I mentioned with VS Code remote development, you can set up a sandboxed environment pretty quickly. That setup for me following the documentation that we have took about 10 minutes. I did have some background in Docker, so like that learning curve was eliminated from that setup time that I'm telling you. But that would really allow you to get a project right in that container, run it, debug it, and throw it away. Um, 10 minute setup is longer than for the whole experiment to take. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my, my board example, it would, I'd just go file, new project, mm -hmm. two, three minutes, like my quick it main, throw it away, done it. Never say to this guy could just, is my idea for code working? Is there any really tiny workflows mm -hmm. that we could imagine if not out in the future? Yeah, uh, the other thing that I think that you could do is literally just open a new folder, Have you have your configuration already there, do build and debug active file, so you don't need to do additional configuration and delete that folder when you're done. So either of those I think could get you pretty close to your ideal situation. Go ahead. So I don't want to sound picky, but I'm usually getting a hard time developing on Visual Studio with large projects mm -hmm. um, because uh, the IDE freezes regularly and also crashes, also 2019. And so how does uh, Visual Studio Code handle the IntelliSense stuff? Because I, I usually, um, so my experience with Visual Studio is that uh, the IntelliSense stops me from doing my, my work. Mm -hmm. It helps me. A lot of times, but when I want to type something and the the IDE freezes for several minutes, it's not helping at all. So, uh, is there any way to to lift the intelligence to a different thread or even to a different process? Yeah. So the question was around the fact that Visual Studio has been difficult for his development in the sense that it's crashed before, or the intelligence is impeding the development. So whether there was something different that Visual Studio Code offers. So I had mentioned the auto PCH and that setting side of things. How the IntelliSense actually works is we use the same engine that VS uses, which is the EDG engine. And that's what's powering IntelliSense. So that configuration UI and the configuration JSON is to actually configure IntelliSense itself. So you're providing a include path, the compiler path, and all of that. You can customize what those includes look like. There are also various IntelliSense settings that you can work with and customize yourself. So I'll show you what the settings look like. It's a really long 
um, set of settings, but depending on what you're specifically looking for, you can go through here and customize. Yeah, okay, I know I can customize what the what, what it shall show to me, but mm -hmm. can I customize that it shall run on a different thread? So the question was and whether... Not to block the IDE. Whether you could customize that it runs on a different thread, that's not something that is currently available. Um, however, we're considering some functionality like that. So we before, if you didn't have your IntelliSense configured, for example, we would follow you back to the tag parser by default. And we found that that was something that was a pain for a lot of people because then you'd show up with 100 errors, for example. And so instead, now we just don't give you IntelliSense or you will get EDG unless you specifically say you want to fall back to the tag parser. So those are some of the scenarios we're currently working through. I'd like to understand a little bit more about what your project setup is like in the environment to see if maybe there's a workaround for why you want a separate thread for IntelliSense. Okay, yeah. yeah. Did you have a question as well? Uh, actually, I did. Uh, can you actually run like a, like a pre-compile test uh, inside of the uh, either the launch JSON or something, basically like I want to run another executable before the compile even mm -hmm. starts. Can Absolutely. Like generate something beforehand. Yeah. So the question was whether you could run a pre-compiled pre task that is something that you can do in the tasks JSON file. And so this is where we specify if you want a pre-compiled task, if you want a task at compile time. And for example, here, you can put in the various commands, you can add arguments. So really, you can customize it in a number of ways. You can even select uh, what kind of shell you want, what kind of compiler. Yeah. So you can get pretty deep into that. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And I'll put up the slide just one last time. If you want to reach the team, we spend a lot of time on GitHub and Twitter. So announcements generally go on Twitter. People will ask us questions about their specific issues that they've run into, as well as GitHub. If you have any issues that you're able to repro, please do let us know. Feature requests, we're working a lot more in the open now on GitHub. So with the configuration UI, we actually put up our spec on GitHub and asked for feedback. So please do participate. Tell us what you want out of the extension. It's currently in preview. We're working to get it out of preview, but we want to hit certain quality bars. And so that's why I was so excited to come here and speak to some of the experts so you guys could provide us with some feedback of our roadmap and the direction we're moving into. So with that, enjoy the rest of your Friday and the rest of your weekend. If you're staying in Aspen, Hopefully it doesn't snow again tonight. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.